Welcome to worship. We're so glad you're gathered here, hopefully with friends and family. Maybe you're here on campus on the front lawn. We have watch parties at 10 a.m. on Sundays, along with children's activities, and encourage you to come and be part of that while the weather is good. We've had to cancel the 8 a.m. watch parties on Sunday morning. It was just a little too cold last week and had low attendance, but we'll continue to meet at 10 a.m. on Sunday mornings. 
We also have worship on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. We'll be doing a sermon series called The Church Has Issues. And we have worship at 7 p.m. on Wednesday. And we will start the series on the Lord's Prayer. So I encourage you to come to any of those. And Holy Communion is included in each one of those services. Last week we had rally day, and so Sunday school is in full swing, although a little different than normal. Uh, Sunday school takes place on Zoom, uh, in addition to the activity we have at 10 a.m. on Sunday morning. But encourage your kids to go to Sunday school. All of the links and the passcodes for Zoom are on our website under the youth ministry page. So go there. We're also encouraging families to download the Remind app. And there's information about uh, what that is and how to sign up for reminders for each of the different grades uh, on our youth ministry page on our website. Youth group continues tonight at at different times for the younger kids and the high school kids. And the topic for tonight is Adam and Eve and the apple. What was God thinking? So I encourage you to participate in that. For our prayers, we want to remember the family of Dorcas Coons, that's mother to Sherry, Karen, Melbourne, and Linda. She died on Tuesday, surrounded by her family. Pastor Kerry was able to be with, there, be with her to pray with the family, and I was there last week to give them all Holy Communion. Uh, the service will be at a later date, so we're going to keep that family in our prayers. I think that's all of the announcements. Let's prepare our hearts for worship as we pray. Father, through your Holy Spirit, you've called each one of us here to to watch this service, to be moved by your words. We pray that you would speak directly to our hearts and help us to be eternally thankful for the grace you have given us and to extend that celebration to the grace others have received. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We gather for worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I invite you to take a moment to confess your sin before God. Let the Holy Spirit examine your heart. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare unto you the entire forgiveness of all your sin, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, you show perpetual loving kindness to us, your servants. Because we cannot rely on our own abilities, grant us your merciful judgment and train us to embody the generosity of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. And And also also with you. you. And also Also with with you. you. And also with you. And also with you. And also with you. Hi, everybody. I had planned to tell you a story about Moses this morning, but there's breaking news on TV. Let's watch. Are we live? Are we good? Oh, okay. Good morning. This is Jeff Helmstead with FLC News. I'm coming to you live from the desert of Sin, not far from Egypt. We came to you last from the Red Sea and reported on the astonishing phenomenon that happened there. I still can't believe it, but I saw it with my own eyes. Just as the Egyptian soldiers were about to catch up to the people of God, their leader Moses held up his staff and the edge of the sea. The water spread apart, creating a dry path for all of them to cross to the other side. When the final person, when the final Israelite got to the other side, the walls of water came crashing down on the Egyptian soldiers and they all drowned. But the people of God were safe. I've been following these people of God, and now today, another miracle. I'm standing here with a family who are collecting something strange off the ground. Excuse me, ma'am, what what are you picking up? I had nothing to feed my children. There's no food in the desert. I didn't know what I was going to do about providing for my family. But, Mama, I told you God would help us. Why were you... Afraid. God will always take care of us. Moses told us to come out every morning, and as the dew clears, to pick up these little white flakes off the desert floor. It's the bread of the Lord. So children, fill your baskets. And we're supposed to gather enough for one day, right, Papa? That's right, son. God is so good. We'll continue our coverage of these amazing events, so be sure to tune in next week. Live from FLC News, this is Jeff Helmstead. Ooh, this looks good. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 20th chapter. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When the evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace, peace, and mercy to you from Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Can we talk about this parable for a minute? 
I know that when I read a parable, I'm always looking for the hook or for the good news or what's the lesson that I'm supposed to learn here. But I have to tell you, this parable, this one of the landowner, it really gets to me. There isn't much about it that seems very fair or very just. I know that when I work hard, when I've done a really good job at something, I want to be compensated for it. I want to know that I did a good job. I want affirmation that everything I did was great and what was expected. I wonder if that was the case for all the folks in the parable that's told today. It's a pretty simple story. So let's take a look at all the players in it. In the story that Jesus tells, a landowner goes out to the marketplace early in the morning to gather some day laborers. After agreeing to pay them all one denarius, a day's living wage, the minimum required to feed a family, to keep them housed, and to clothe them, he seems to have them hired, and he sends them off to work for the day in the field. During the course of the day, the landowner returns to the marketplace, a surprising four more times throughout the day. He goes at nine in the morning, again at noon when the sun is high, at three in the afternoon, and even again close to dinner time, just an hour before those who were already in the field would be quitting. And he asks them to come and to work in the field, and he promises to pay them whatever is right at the end of the day. Now, surely these workers who are coming later in the day probably were not expecting a full day's wage. But sure enough, when the work day is over, the landowner instructs his manager to pay all of the laborers. The manager proceeds as directed, but he's told to do this in an odd sort of way. He's told to pay them in reverse order, starting with those who worked the least number of hours and working backwards to pay those who had put in a full day. And so the manager proceeds, and would you believe that he pays them all the same amount? Everybody is paid one denarius for the entirety of the day, whether they worked from sun up until sundown or for just one hour before their day was over. When the laborers who had started to work at the crack of dawn saw what was happening, they were enraged and they protested in the blatant unfairness of the landowner. These last have worked only one hour, they say, and you have made them equal to us who bared the burden of this entire day. Those of us who worked in the blazing sun, who worked in the hottest and driest of conditions, but the landowner deflects. He's not about to hear their griping, and he answers them with a question. He says, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? The story of the landowner and the workers in the vineyard is one that you are likely familiar with. Have you ever thought about who it is that you identify most with in this story? Is it the landowner? Is it the workers? Is it the workers at the beginning of the day or those who maybe just came on for the last hour? Maybe sometimes, maybe always, you feel like you've been on both ends of the stories, sometimes needing the work just to get by until the next day, and sometimes feeling like you have an abundance to share. How about our motivated type A personalities? The early bird gets the worm type. Of course, you would have been one of the 6 a.m. workers in the landowner's vineyard. Of course, you would have been the first in line and ready to go as soon as the sun came up. Of course, you would work the hardest and the longest. Of course, you would be the most deserving of the landowner's praise and of your full wage. After all, you're the type A worker B, the good kid, the one who's always getting done with whatever it is that you agreed to do. But consider this, how does the parable read if you situate yourself at the end of the line? It's a pretty different place to be. Now you're the worker who got more than they expected, the ones who received more pay than they probably even thought they had deserved. Wouldn't you too be ecstatic at the end of that workday, stunned, thrilled, and so grateful? 
We don't know why they weren't hired in the first place. We don't know if they couldn't be there early in the morning because they were taking care of their family, or if they were disabled, or if they were the least of these who weren't sure that they would be hired at all, but knew they had to bring something home to their family. What they experienced that day was pure blessing. And I'll bet that when they went on the end of the line, that was one big joyful party. Those who got more than they expected, those who knew that their work was appreciated, even when it was only a small amount of work, but it was the most they could do. I'll bet when they got home that night, they were even more grateful that they would be able to provide for themselves and their family after only hours earlier in the day wondering how they were going to explain that there was no work for them that day and they had nothing to bring home and they didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. What a relief, what a gift, what a free gift that they received that day. Now, the early workers didn't feel like they got what they deserved. Surely they should have received more. They worked more. They had been there all day long. This was not fair. They must have been angered by the iniquity, wanting what they felt they so deserved. They surely grumbled. They were bitter, filled with envy. And can we blame them? Don't we expect to receive what it is that we have worked hard for? But the landowner had, had indeed honored his agreement with them. And even though they had received their daily bread, though they lacked no good thing, they spent their off hours consumed that night with frustration and anger. And the landowner asked them, Are you envious because I am generous? The Greek translation would say, is your eye evil because I am good? Maybe if God's generosity offends us so much, it's because we don't have eyes to see where we actually stand in the line of God's overwhelming kindness and grace. How much easier it would have been to pay the all-day laborers first, sending them home before they could see what their less deserving counterparts had received. But the landowner, he wanted them to see the kind of vineyard that he ran. He wanted them to experience radical generosity for the other. He wanted them to surrender their envy and to join the party with those who are blessed in ways beyond measure that they did not know was coming. And these questions at the end of the text, at the end of our reading today, man, are they convicting. Is it right for you to be angry? Are you envious because God is generous? When you hear those questions, which one sits ugly with you? That is your question to ask today. And when that question grabs hold of you, then you have already begun to hear so much about who we are and about God's radical generosity. In this parable, I think we see things happen that we might not like, the last being first and the first being last, that generosity is something that is not often understood. Often not understood on the receiving end or when we look at it from the outside, we have an inherent resistance in receiving generosity or watching others re receive generosity that we believe should be intended for us. Our human nature is to anticipate a quid pro quo situation, to assume that we did something to deserve the generosity that is given upon us. Caroline Lewis, a Luther Seminary professor, explains about generosity. She says, we don't even know how to respond to true generosity. How many times have you found yourself saying, really, me? Why? For no reason. Are you sure? What did I do? What can I do to deserve this? So we relegate generosity to equality, to accountability, to measurability. And in the process, what we end up doing is deconstructing generosity, discounting it as mere gratitude, demeaning the abundance that it displays, making that which has no limits determinate and quantifiable. 
This parable is a reminder of the absolute gift of generosity that does not demand response, that does not account for reciprocity, and that cannot be measured, because then generosity is not generous. By definition, generosity is not measurable or accountable or calculable. And therein lies the point of this parable, that God is about incalculable grace. And grace, by definition, cannot be computable. God's generosity is exemplified in this parable, but also extends so far beyond it. Not sure that this parable is asking of us the same generosity. We might not actually even have the capacity to live out the truest of generosity. I'm not sure that we're programmed for it, but we can certainly try. And can we hold back? Can we hold back from the envy and the grumbling when grace is extended and generosity is shared with those who need it most rather than what we view as those who have deserved it most. We can live in ways that celebrate both being on the giving or the receiving end of generosity, and even on the side that is simply looking in on acts of generosity as they happen. What is Jesus telling us in this parable about the need for generosity as both received and extended? The desire for generosity sensed as unmerited and unexpected. The urge to be generous to others that does indeed come from our very soul and that knows the truth about God and God's desires for us. What are the ways that we can tap into that sense of generosity as an extension of the welcome and hospitality and love and abundance that we have experienced in God's urgent advances to be in relationship with each and every one of us? Even if fleeting, perhaps we can extend generosity and not so much for the sake of ourselves, but for the sake of the other, who might then get to see into the eyes of God and get a glimpse of God's very heart and soul. And so that ugly question, are you envious because I am generous? Yes, Lord, I am. So remind me and teach me and lead me to remember that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And your grace will be extended for all, for radical generosity is yours in the kingdom of God. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Father, we thank you for the extraordinary grace that you have given each one of us to forgive our sins and welcome us into your kingdom. Help us to celebrate the grace that you give to us as well as the grace that you extend to others. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for our world. We pray especially for the West that is on fire and and all those people who've lost homes and, and some who've lost loved ones. We pray that you would douse the flames, that you would put out the fire and, and give guidance and protection to, to firefighters and all in harm's way. And we also pray for those who are in the path of hurricanes. We pray that you would protect them and that you would make those storms to cease just as you calm the waters. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we pray for those who are sick and need healing and ask that you would lay your healing hands upon them. We pray especially that you would put an end to COVID-19 and the coronavirus, that you would wipe that from the face of the earth and bring healing to all people. We especially ask that you bring healing to those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy. Father, we thank you for the beginning of Sunday school and, and all the kids that were here for rally day and ask that you would bless teachers now as they teach online via Zoom and, and some in person on Sundays. We pray that you would bless them and inspire them, that you would use those connections to raise your children in the faith that they would know your son, Jesus. We pray especially for those sixth graders who received Bibles this week that that would be a blessing to them, that they would read your word and be formed to be followers of your Son. Lord, in your mercy. All these things, Father, and whatever else you see that we need, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. 
In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, quiet on set. Take 245. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I got to go home. <laughs>